Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you that we can worship you freely. As Amanda said, Lord, we can lean into you and listen to you freely. Help us to do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to have my wife here, Christine, um, also African, born in um, Burundi. Parents, four generations of family worked in Rwanda. Going to speak from the parable of the Good Samaritan. I've been doing that for several weeks because one of the things, privileges I get, if you speak in a different church every week, is you can look at the same passage and dig and dig and dig. I once, uh, first time I ever went to Australia, um, was in Sydney and Melbourne, preached 20 times on the trip. And one brother was with me, and he listened to every single time. I preached the same message every time. He said it was never the same twice. And he's a good brother who loves me. So, uh, <laughs> Parable of the Good Samaritan. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Actually, we need to start a little bit earlier, don't we? Um, verse 25. One day, an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do it, do this and you will live. Now, notice the next thing, because I'm going to come back to that. The man wanting to justify himself or his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Uh, people, when they dodge the truth, ask a question. Uh, what do you mean by truth? And so on. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem. I'm reading from the NLT, by the way, New Living Translation. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. I want you to notice the two word, first two words of that sentence. By chance. Oran, Laila Igajisu, by chance. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant, a Levite, walked, o walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care, care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. And Jesus turned to the lawyer. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor? Because he'd asked, who is my neighbor? To the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Now notice uh, the Jews despised the Samaritans. It said the Samaritan despised Samaritan. So the, the Jewish ruler could not say the Samaritan um, because that was just too embarrassing and shameful. So he said the one who showed him mercy, which is actually a better answer. And Jesus said, Ni chu yang xing, you go and do the same thing. Okay, now, I want to look at that from various points of view. The first question is, what, what did Jesus actually mean? When he said, go and do thou likewise, what does he mean? And what does he mean when he said, go and show him mercy? Let me give you a quote from a friend. I, I need to explain the background to this one. Um, we lived in Singapore for 13 years. We're still permanent residents in Singapore, um, though we live in Taiwan, have done for 15 years. We had a very, very close friend there. 
uh, Sing Zhou. Uh, English name was Alec. Uh, that brother, we went to Singapore in 1994. To be perfectly honest, if it wasn't for him and his family, I don't think we would have made it. Uh, just think, five young British girls, our daughters, aged 16, 14, 12, and twins of nine, yanked out of England and moved to Singapore. It's not just that the weather's different, everything's different. Um, if you're Singaporean, uh, in our midst, are there any Singaporeans here? Uh, forgive me, Dodo uh, Ian Liang, but <laughs> one of our daughters was in um, a kind of a, a government school, and um, on the first day, one of her fellow students came up and said, now this is English, said to her, want to go to toilet la? Which being into, you know what that means, don't you? Do you want to go to the toilet? Want to go to toilet la? Uh, because Singaporeans are brilliant. They have uh, a minimum, I would think, of three languages, every Singaporean, but not all of them are totally perfect. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> so... Um, Many Taiwanese wouldn't know what which means, I think it's Cantonese, isn't it? It it's, uh, means 315, or 20 over dollars, which is Arshador um, Kwai. So they're, they're brilliant languages, all mix in a really thrilling way. But it wasn't easy for our daughters, and Alec helped us in incredible ways. We were in a given a house to live in that had no air conditioners. And if you've ever been to Singapore, it, it's quite difficult for Brits to live in Singapore without air conditioners, uh, day or night. And he passed away recently. We, we knew he was ill. We'd hoped to get down there, because uh, we go there regularly, but haven't been able to because of COVID. And uh, eventually, he passed away. So we literally jumped on a plane and went straight down there. Um, because the family has meant so much. And his daughter, in the Hua uh, Hua service, in the, in the service before the uh, cremation, this is what she said. Someone, uh, speaking of her dad, someone once said that the true measure of a man is how he treats the people who may not seem to matter. Hence, the greatest compliment I've heard about my dad, this is... Alex's daughter talking about him, came from a security guard at OCBC Tower. OCBC is uh, one of the big three banks, maybe, DBS, UBS, OCBC, probably one of the three or so big, big banks. So when you're talking about the tower, you're not talking about this building. You're talking about a city center massive building. And this security guard, his job was to open the door for... Uh, clients coming in. He said, your father is a very nice man. Everybody walks past me. I smile at them, but they won't even look at me. Now, you can imagine that. Everybody, he opens the door, and everybody... But the guy said this. He said, your father knows my name and greets me every time. That was Alec. That, that to me is a guy who cares about other people. Somebody that nobody even noticed or was concerned about. He not only knew the guy, greeted the guy, but he knew his name. And more than that, he would come to me and say some of the Ye Guangming, the Derek Prince materials that we have. He said, can I print some of these materials just to give as tracts, as gospel tracts to these people, which he did at his own expense. Uh, he, he stands for me as the kind of guy who noticed people and cared for people. Uh, on every level, being with Alec, he, he was aware of the needs of other people from big to small. We had a, a work in northwest China amongst the minority people who actually are farmers. They, believe it or not, grow potatoes, not rice. And we took in a... Um, Scottish expert who revolutionized uh, their crop, grew six times by giving them a good potato stock and so on. But 
They, they were some of the poorest people in China, in, in the mountains of Gansu. I, I told Alex, some of these kids can't even get to school because there isn't even a government school in the area. He raised the money, I don't know if you know the Lee Foundation, from the Lee Foundation, to build a school which is still educating the kids to today. Who, who was the hero in the story? It was a nobody guy who cared for other people, who cared for a body on the ground. And we say, look, the, the priest was busy being religious. He probably had a meeting to go to. What strikes me is, is something, uh, and I think it's the same in every translation, but if you look at verse 31, uh, no, verse uh, 30, it says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. We know the direction of the Jewish man was away from Jerusalem, not towards the temple, but away from the temple. He was, he was going home. And probably the priest and the Levite were not going, you know, we always say, oh, they were busy, they had religious responsibilities. It doesn't actually say that. They quite possibly were going home, but they just saw a body on the ground and said and felt this has nothing to do with me. The Samaritan saw a man who despised him, a Jew on the ground, and went over and took care of him and in all likelihood saved his life. The Lord wants to produce that kind of expression of his love in us. And I, I want to look at two keys to that today. Key number one is am I in love with me and are you in love with you? In other words, I would suggest that we can be a believer in Jesus but at the same time our focus is on ourselves, not on others. It, again, going back to what the man said, uh, or to what is said of him in verse 29, but the man wanting to justify his actions. In other words, Jesus said, you've answered right. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Really, isn't the honest response to that, I still have a little bit of way to go <laughs> before I'm really doing that? But he doesn't want to do that. He, he wants, in front of a crowd, to say, look, here's this rabbi, he was a carpenter, he doesn't really have the education I have, so I, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to argue with him. I'm going to focus on me and let people know how clever, clever I am. Let me suggest to you that the Bible is full of that kind of, of sentiment. If, if you look down below in the passage, it says <clears throat> in verse 39, uh, her sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he taught. There's Luke 10, 39. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her, Shanka Fa Ming Ling, tell her to come to me and help me. Uh, that, that, that's the same attitude, isn't it? There is, see, Jesus said, um, verse 42, there's only one thing worth being concerned about, Mary, uh, Martha, Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Mary is doing the correct thing. You, Martha, are all about yourself. Uh, David Pawson, if you know David Pawson, said, Jesus never did anything a woman told him to do. Actually, Jesus never did anything either a man or a woman told him to do. So Mary comes full of, uh, Martha, I'm sorry, comes full of Martha and says, can't you see this situation? I, you really don't understand? I'm going to tell you what to do. Jesus said, you're missing the one thing. Why? Because, Martha, you're full of yourself and of what you're doing. You're 
organizing your world and missing what is really important. If you look in Luke chapter 12, there's another very interesting example of it. Luke 12, 1. Meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling around and stepping on each other. There were thousands of people there. Jesus turned first to his disciples and warned them. So Jesus, in the middle of that crowd, is instructing his disciples with teaching they, and for that matter, the crowd, really needed to hear. Uh, For example, verse 8, I tell you the truth, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the Son of Man will acknowledge in the presence of God's holy angels. But anyone who denies me here on earth will be denied before God's holy angels. Then a verse that some people wrestle with, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man will, can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And the simple answer to that one in passing is if you're really worried about that, you're not doing it. Because the people who blaspheme against the Spirit have no sense of what they're doing. They're dead spiritually. So Jesus is is giving this really, really important teaching. And verse 13, then someone called from the crowd. I think, sorry, I need to turn this one on. Then someone called from the crowd and said, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, now, get, get, get that. Jesus is teaching to thousands of people. In the middle of that, Jesus is teaching his disciples. So this is, this is a critical teaching session. This guy walks up and says, Jie Kuang, Jie Kuang, get out of the way. I have something I want to say to the teacher, which is nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about. It's all about him. And he says, hey, I've got a use for you, Jesus. Divide the estate. And Jesus said, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide things like that? And then go straight back into the teaching. There's another example, um, which I think is a very interesting one. This is all about a block to really, really engaging with what Jesus wants us to do to care for other people is when it's iwa, when my life is about me. My life is about, I may know Jesus, I may love Jesus, but actually what I'm looking for in all of this is, is that I, I get blessed, that Jesus does what I want him to do. Jeremiah chapter 42, where there is a very, very interesting example of this. Uh, and I think not absent from the church today. If you look at uh, verses 2 to 3, this is when um, the Babylonians are attacking uh, Israel and God is judging his people for repeated idolatry. Shortly after this, they say, uh, we've gone back to worshiping the Queen of Heaven because all our troubles have been because we didn't worship her which is exactly the opposite of what God said. So uh, Jeremiah is saying, you, you need to stay in, in Babylon and surrender, in, in Jerusalem and surrender to the Babylonians. So they come to him in verse 2. They said, please pray to the Lord your God for us. As you can see, we're only a tiny remnant compared to what we were before. Pray that the Lord God will show us what to do and where to go. Really, really spiritual. Just we're here, just tell us what the Lord is saying. And then they say in verse 5, may the Lord your God, notice that, may the Lord, who's God? Your God, Jeremiah, be a faithful witness against us if we refuse to obey what he tells us to do. Whether we like it or not, we will obey the Lord your God to whom, you are send, to whom we are sending you with our plea, For if we obey him, everything will turn out well. So they say, get the word of the Lord for us, and we promise you, and we promise God, we'll do what he says. So Jeremiah, interestingly, waits on the Lord, but it takes 10 days to get his reply. 
can I just say, God is not a slot machine. Uh, that sometimes when we want to hear him, he delays because he wants us to be in the right place. We, we had a family situation I think it's okay to talk about. Uh, one of our daughters is involved in a very, very big project making Christian movies uh, in the States. And for months and months, they've been trying to raise the investment. Um, and we prayed and they prayed and uh, it, it just got, it, frequently, it was going to come tomorrow, but it didn't come. It's going to come tomorrow and it didn't come. But I really, we really appreciate our daughter because even when people said it will come tomorrow and it didn't come, I mean, this is a lot of money for a series of movies. Even when the money didn't come, she stood in a place of faith and said, I believe God is saying that it will come. When it, to be honest, looked anything but like it would come. But she waited on the Lord and not 10 days, but how long would you say? Two years? Three? I mean, the, the critical point has been three months. And on Friday, it came through with half an hour in it, it, the money comes into LA before the banks closed. Uh, God doesn't always, uh, as a tremendous friend of mine, uh, an Aussie friend and co-worker from Perth used to say, he said, God is never late, but he certainly misses a lot of opportunities to be early. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so they're saying, yep, go and get the word. Jeremiah waits on the Lord. And the reaction, having said, we will do what God said. In chapter 43, verse 1, you lie. The Lord our God hasn't forbidden us to go to Egypt. Baruch, the son of Neriah, has convinced you to say this. It's not God. It, it, it's your scribe has told you this because he wants us to stay here and be killed by the Babylonians. Brothers and sisters, is there, can I say this carefully, a brokenness before the Lord in our lives? Is there, have we come to the place where it's not about me programming God to do what I want him to do. It's about the Lord having folk who are, if I say broken, we can misunderstand that, who's personal strength and resistance to God has been removed by the grace of God so that really all we want is to hear what the Lord is saying. I suggest to you that there are two kinds of believers. There are those for whom that is true and those for whom that is not true. And if it's not true, in my own life, they were separated, those two events, by probably about five years that I accepted the Lord as Savior um, from a non-Christian family, um, knew him as Savior in a group called Scripture Union, which does exist in Taiwan, but not much, where they led me to the Lord, they taught me to read the Word, and went up to Cambridge University to study and was, was walking with the Lord. But in, in Cambridge, the Lord came to me and he said this. He said, son, I'm your Savior, but I'm not your Lord. I'm not in charge of your life at all. And that was a real, real battle. That surrendering to the Lord and saying, okay, I'm going to put the whole thing in your hands. I'm going to put my plans, everything. Uh, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't done that because this wasn't my idea to come to Taiwan 53 years ago. So the first thing that we wrestle with is this need to surrender to the Lord, this need to I'll give you some, some quotes on it. All along, they, the folk in Jeremiah's day, they had regarded God as a power to enlist, not a Lord to obey. See, see what that guy's saying? He's a, a famous uh, evangelical theologian in England. They thought God was someone that you could get on your side to do what you wanted, not a Lord who wanted obedience. How about this one? Never make any plans unless you're willing to have God change them 
And never pray unless you're willing to accept God's answer. That's challenging, isn't it? How about that? Never make any plans unless you're willing to have God change them. And finally, it is clear that Johanan, in asking Jeremiah to pray for God's guidance, had already made his mind up. He didn't want guidance. He wanted confirmation. It's a problem many of us face in our prayer lives. We're not truly open to God. We don't take seriously the possibility that he might say something that doesn't fit with our previous preconceived ideas. What, what the, the main thing I want to say this morning is this. When Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself, did it ever occur to you that that's the only way to be happy? That if you don't walk those ways, you aren't going to be happy. You think you are. You think I can choose my way and I know much better than God what's best for me. But it doesn't work. I mean, I'm thinking of a parallel in your world. Farming God's way, as it were, doing it in the flow of nature and not abusing nature, whatever, is saying, well, Lord, you made the world, so you must know better how to do this. And our lives are like that. Our lives flourish when we go to God's word and we say, this really is the best way to live. This really is the way to make us happy. It, if, if I look at my life at my ancient age, um, I'm so thankful that God took it over and showed me what he wanted with it, not what I wanted with it. I'm so glad that any choice, including marriage and this kind of thing, we put before the Lord, not ourselves, saying, Lord, we want you to be Lord, and we want to walk in the world in your way, like Alec Chu did, caring for the people around us. You know why? Because I have a simple scientific theory about the Holy Spirit, put it that way. <laughs> when we reach out to care for someone else, the Holy Spirit moves through us towards them. In other words, we finish blessed as the middle point in the Holy Spirit activity. For instance, um, if you meet someone and you witness to them, you share with them the love of Jesus, do you feel better or do you feel worse? Now, it may be they abuse you. That's always possible, isn't it? But essentially, bringing the love of Jesus to someone or Alec smiling and knowing the name of the OCBC doorkeeper, that brings joy into your life whereas the kind of deliberately ignoring that kind of person does exactly the opposite uh, I'm sure there's been some scientific research on that but uh, since the last science exam I took I got 7% um, I won't go into that so the first question is do we want to obey do we want to obey the Lord is that in our hearts do I want to do what God says? Have I actually come to the place that I have a father who wants the best for me? I have a heavenly father who genuinely wants the best for me and moreover knows what's best for me. It's, it's such a thrilling thing. But I've got to go on because there's a whole bamboo. And this is where it gets really interesting. You, you remember I said that, going back to Luke chapter 10, that by chance, by chance they were... Verse, where are we? Luke chapter 10, verse... Uh, verse 31 by chance a priest came down by chance a priest came down and that word has increasingly struck me that 
The priest didn't get up that day and while brushing his teeth, if he was a priest, he probably had a big beard so he wouldn't be shaving, but while brushing his teeth and, and, and doing whatever he did, drinking his coffee, except he didn't, um, he didn't think, today I'm going to pass a body on the ground, do I want to stop or not? No, I don't think I want to stop, no. It was by chance, he hadn't planned to see the body. The, pre, the Levite had not planned to see the body. The Samaritan didn't plan to see a body by the road. It happened by chance. Uh, what I want to say to you is to be walking in care for others, you have to understand that a lot of what God does, small or big, is by chance. I'm going to give you some examples. This guy is called Robert Rakes. You reckon what? 200 years ago? 1750s, 1750s which is oh, mathematics. Um, getting on for 300 years ago. Thank you, thank you. What a sushi, boho. Or a nigga, she's a sway. What a sushi, lao, she's a. Ni meo si wong. He said, you will need the fairies to get you through. <laughs> well, I passed, so, but it was God, not the fairies. Uh, mathematics and I, we never really connected, nor science. But the English education system means you can be good at three or four subjects and get to Cambridge. But let's, let's not go there. Um, this, this, uh, this guy was a rich Englishman. Now think... If you know Jane Austen or, or stories like that, you know, think of the, the country house and the huge garden and the servants all over the place, but he did not have a gardener. So he went into a nearby town called Gloucester, and he went into Gloucester to find a gardener. Somebody said, if you go to such and such a place, you'll find Mr. Smith, who's a gardener. But Mr. Smith lived in the slum area, the poor area of Gloucester, and in those days, kids, even as young, I think, as 9 and 10, worked in factories. They didn't go to school. They worked in factories from that kind of age. And he listened to them talking in the street, because it was Sunday when he went in, and they were, that was their one day off. And their language was worse than the worst of the kind of bars in downtown Ta Taipei. And he was absolutely horrified by it. They, were, they had no education. They had no future. They were slum kids of the worst uneducated kind. So he was shocked enough that he went home and prayed. And he hired four ladies who were Christians. Because he had money. He said, I'm going to hire you on Sundays when those kids are free to run schools for them in which we'll teach them to read and write, we'll teach them basic mathematics, and we'll teach them the Bible and to love Jesus. And after two or three years of that, it actually proved to be extremely successful because the kids, I guess, realized that this is our one hope of having a future outside of this terrible life. And... Some of them became Christians and their lives were changed. And his father not only had left him the big mansion, his father owned a newspaper, a local newspaper. And so he wrote about what was happening in the newspaper and the London Times picked up the article and published it all over England. Now you say, well, what's the story there? That is the birth of what we call Sunday School. That's where Sunday schools came from. Now, obviously, they take a very difficult, for, different form because most of us can read and write um, and don't work in factories from the age of 9 or 10. But that's the birth of the Sunday school movement. What's my point? A guy went to find a gardener and found a calling from God, which to this day has effect. This lady, Ida Scudder, her family had 40 missionaries in India over, I guess, 
100, 150 year, year period. 40 missionaries. She was born in India. Now, she was, I think, about 120 years ago when India was a very different country. And her dad was a doctor. She, at the age of eight, was sent to the States to get educated. And this is what she said. I will never, ever go back to India. Because at that time, it was extremely poor. And her father, as a missionary in the kind of, kind of countryside, it, she said, I, I, forgive me saying this, I despise this place. It's poor. It's, it's horrible. I'm going to go to the States. I'm going to get educated. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. I'm going to live in the States. Never, ever go back to India for the rest of my life. However, her mother got ill, and so she returned to, in, to India only to see her mother. But, Oran, by chance, one night she was there, when she was there, three men in the same evening came to see her father. All of them said separately, our wives are pregnant and they're seriously ill. We desperately need medical help. But in Indian culture at the time, a male doctor could not treat a female patient. So he couldn't respond. And there wasn't a female doctor or nurse in the clinic. So the next morning, all three women were dead and all three children were dead. Mary Scudder, uh, Ida Scudder, basically went low before the Lord repented, went back to America, trained as a doctor, came back to India, and spent the rest of her life in India. She started with clinics, then through donations from the States, built a hospital which trained female nurses and then female doctors, and finally male doctors as well. It, the report I read said it is still one of the two best hospitals in the whole of India. Oran, by chance. If those three men had not come that night, she probably would have gone back to the States, married, and missed her destiny. Instead of which, because something happened, her life was changed. Okay, one more. Sinai Igarin. Um, J.O. Fraser. J.O. Fraser was a Brit. And I'm going to show you a brief movie clip in about 20 seconds. He went to southwest China, to Yunnan. Uh, but he went to the countryside of Yunnan and worked with a people that we call the Lisu people, Lisu Tzu. This is how it happened. I'll tell you how it happened and then describe. Can you, can you try the clip if we can make it work? All right, so he's in London University. He's an engineering student and he's a near classical musician. I'm going to have to translate because it's in Chinese, so don't play it too loud, please. I tried to cut it, but I couldn't. 1909, a student in London University was just finishing his final year as an engineering student. His future was very bright. But on that day, he was reading a little booklet. If our Lord were to come back today and find so many unreached, he obviously needed to, would need to ask us the question, why are there so many people in the world unreached with the gospel? This is his daughter, his real daughter, actually. My father was faced with the fact that the Christians are called to go into all the world with the gospel. It's not a job for angels. We must decide whether we want to obey the Lord or not. This little booklet caused my father, that's uh, J.O. Fraser, to cease his plans for engineering. And in fact, he finished his, career, his education, 
and then joined Nadi Hui, the China Inland Mission, in about 1910, and went to China. He worked. Now, this is the end of the movie. I've cut to the end of the movie. He saw 600 Lisu people turn from darkness to the Lord Jesus. When he went, there was not a single believer amongst the Lisu people, not one single believer. But he went from London. Without knowing where he was going, except to China, in Shanghai, he was asked by the mission authorities to go to southwest China, to a very rural area. I mean, it's still pretty rural, but in those days, extremely rural. And in the marketplace, again, Oran, there were there are a number of of Shoshu Minzu of tribes in、um, Yunnan. He saw the Lisu people, and God spoke to his heart. He worked for seven years without really seeing any fruit at all. He prayed, his home church prayed, and then God suddenly said, "I will give you a hundred families, six hundred people." And he saw a wave of the Holy Spirit. To this day, the Lisu people, in terms of size of population and number of Christians, have the highest Christian population. Of any minority people in China, because a young man with a great future in engineering, who was a classical musician, because that young man said, "I need to respond to what this booklet is saying." I don't know who gave him the booklet. I don't know why he was reading it in London University Library, but he saw that challenge and responded to it. Gave the rest of his life to the Lisu people, who, to this day, have many, many Christians amongst them. By chance, who put the booklet in his hand? Again and again, every Sunday on、uh, we we one of the ministries my wife and I run is called Field Partner. Every Sunday on the Field Partner International、uh, Facebook page, I post a biography of a missionary. I posted one about a Welshman this morning called Griffith John, who, at the age of 16, was known to be one of the best preachers in Wales. But Oran, a missionary, came to his church and spoke, and he knew that God was speaking to him. So he spent the rest of his life in China, church planting in.、Uh, Central China and beyond,、uh, training up the next generation and so on. So my point is number two: Are we interruptible? Can we be interrupted by the Lord? Whether in big things or small things, the Lord will speak into our lives. The Lord will arrange. By chance, events in our lives. Some of them define the rest of our lives. Some of you know, Gina, Gina, Gina. Some of you know my testimony.、Um, as a Cambridge student, I had appendicitis. I went into hospital. I had just surrendered to the Lord, but I had no interest whatsoever in mission and absolutely no interest in the Chinese people. This was about 1962, and.、Uh, I grabbed a book. In those days, there was no line, there was no WhatsApp, there was no YouTube, there was none of that stuff. You actually had to read a thing called a book. And I, 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 I grabbed a book. I'd never read it actually, but I read the front page, first few pages. Why the guy went to China as a missionary. Then there was a TV program about the Chinese still in hospital after appendicitis operation. Then a nurse walked in and said, "Have you ever thought of being a missionary to the Chinese?" And walked out of my room, and I knew that Oran was God's calling on my life. It defined the next almost sixty years of my life. So, brothers and sisters, are we interruptible? Let me look at one final passage, and then you'll be relieved to hear I'm done. <laughs>、um, 
Go with me to Exodus chapter 3. How do we respond to the Lord, to his Oran? It can be just the Lord saying to us, I want you to speak to that person, to care for that person today. It can be someone you see and you get a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that's one of the most exciting things about being a Christian? That the Holy Spirit can speak to us in our daily lives and say, this is what I want you to do. That will bring blessing to us and blessing to others. Other Oran define the whole course of our lives. Moses in Exodus 3. One day, Exodus 3 verse 1, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jericho, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. Moses has his day planned as a shepherd. He's caring for the flock. If you remember David, there are lions and bears and bad people around. So Moses is engaged with the sheep. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the uh, the bush burning up? The first thing, the first thing he did is he stopped. He stopped. He ceased doing what he was doing and he focused on God beginning to break into his life. That's the first step. Very carefully I, I can say this. Whether, whether it's the Holy Spirit drawing us to faith in Jesus, whether it's God's call on, the, on our lives, whether it's something that happens just as we we walk down the street, we have a choice to stop and listen or to carry on. And when the angel saw, verse 4, when the Lord saw that Moses coming to take a closer look, see, when Moses said, God, I'm listening, God called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. So stop, then look and listen to what God is saying. The most exciting thing, I'll say it again, is that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and leads us. Always in accordance with the Word of God, but that's what he does. Then the Lord says, um, I'm calling you to go to Egypt. For the sake of time, I'll just look at verse 7. The Lord said, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. What the Lord said is, Moses, I want you to embrace the way I feel about these people. That's a critical step. A um, couple of people have said to me, how are you doing? I think they mean because England lost in the World Cup. Um, I, think, I thought they were going to lose. So when I woke at 5 o'clock this morning and turned on my phone and it was two minutes to go in extra, you know, time added on, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't heartbroken. I wasn't, oh, oh, oh. Can I face tomorrow? Um, Because I thought they were going to lose. So there you go. If you prepare yourselves for shocks. Um, But really, because I love sports, I love cricket, I love soccer, um, occasionally rugby, but I'm Scottish and it gets depressing at times. So... Don't pay too much attention to that. But I don't want to waste my energy, emotional energy, too much on that kind of thing. I support Arsenal. I don't watch Arsenal anymore, even though they're at the moment top of the Premier League, because I get too involved. Um, I would be embarrassed to let you see what happens to me (laughs) when I'm watching Arsenal, particularly when they're losing. Um, I want my emotion to be available to the Lord for what he wants. So it really matters what we look at. It really matters what we listen to. It really matters what what sucks the energy out of our hearts. Because God says, I want a clean emotional care for others. That's what the Lord says, I have. I want you to share that. And when God does his Oran, when God breaks through in our lives, 
He gives us his love for the people that we're working with. Uh, when J.O. Fraser, the guy I just mentioned, when, when God called him to the Lisu people, actually in the marketplace there were all kinds of shaoshu minzu, of minority people, but this one people, the Lisu people, to whom God had called him, had a kind of seeing ni, had a kind of drawing power that the other minorities, he didn't reject the others, it was just he was called to that group. Where God calls and where we respond, there is a, if you like, a satisfaction and an identifying and an ability to care which wouldn't be there without the Lord. It's supernatural. And finally, God said this awful thing to Moses. He said, I want you to go. Uh, Moses said, that's, that's a really bad idea. Verse 10, now go, for I'm sending you. The emotion isn't enough. The emotion demands response. The emotion is good for prayer. The emotion is good for care. But the response has to be a going. There is no fulfillment of God's aura and of God's by chance in our lives until we respond. The priest walks by on the other side. The Levite goes and has a look and walks away. The Samaritan cares in a very practical way for the person who is lying injured on the road. So let me make one final comment. I've asked you, am I the center? Are you the center? Or are you in God's hands? Secondly, are you interruptible? But let me say one more thing. You may say, oh, what a rinsang tai fuza, what a zung dan tai doa. Uh, my life is too complicated. My burdens are too, do too many. Let me say something very simple. It's supernatural. It isn't in our strength. It isn't something God is saying, okay, you do it in your strength. Honestly, after 53 years as a missionary, it's 53 years since I came here, I can honestly say this. Why at almost 80 years of age would I still be doing this? Why am I not growing roses or watching my wife grow roses. Well, I can tell you why I'm not growing roses, but that's a different issue. It's because, it's because God supplies everything you need to serve him. It, if you say, I can't do it, it's too much, God says, I know it's too much. Learn to pray. Learn to wait on me. Call upon me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. He is a God who waits for those who call on him. First time I ever went into China in about 1982, the verse the Lord gave me is this, Psalm 27. I would have lost hope unless I believed that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have a purpose for each of us. And Lord, I pray for these Oran, pray for these by chance, pray for these it happened encounters in our lives. Lord, I pray for any who've walked away from that. Pray for any who felt it's too much, it, it's too heavy. I, I, or I just can't trust the Lord in this. I just feel, I hadn't planned to do this, but actually just want to take a minute because I think there are one or two who... God has actually spoken to you and for whatever reason, and it may be a very good reason, it's, it's too much, life's too hard, things didn't work out as you pleased, uh, maybe you started in ministry and nobody saw what you were doing, uh, brackets, join the club, um, and you walked away from it. I, I just feel God is saying to some, go back to that place when I spoke to you. Go back to the place of my calling. Because in response to that calling, you will find a happiness you will not find anywhere else. If that's you, as we bow our heads to pray, would you raise your hand, please? If you've, because of pressure in your life, kind of walked away from what the Lord was doing in your life. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I, I just pray for each one in that situation. 
that Lord they would encounter you as father as a good good father who would never ask us to do what we can't do together with you help us to see that in your narrow path is the only place where we're really going to be happy loving you and loving our neighbor in Jesus name amen